is the new way we work from Fast Company Magazine, where we take listeners on a journey through the changing landscape of our work lives and explain exactly what we need to build the future we want. I'm Fast Company Deputy Editor Kathleen Davis. When the Supreme Court issued the ruling in June that race-based affirmative action in college admissions was unconstitutional, it not only sent universities scrambling, it also caused a lot of confusion within companies. What would it mean for diversity, equity, and inclusion departments and initiatives? It didn't help that as soon as the decision was issued, opponents of DEI efforts capitalized on the confusion with fearmongering and misinformation. Take the letter sent from the attorneys general of 13 states in July to 100 CEOs of some of the largest companies. The letter threatens, quote, serious legal consequences for companies that set race or ethnicity quotas around hiring and supplier diversity. Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton also sent a similar threatening letter to several top law firms. And shortly after, an anti-affirmative action group filed a lawsuit against a venture capital firm that offers grants to black women. Adding fear of legal action to a law change that already had many confused makes for an even more challenging environment for DEI efforts at companies, especially at a time when some companies have been quietly rolling back their earlier commitments. So how does the affirmative action ruling actually change both hiring and DEI initiatives at companies? What impacts of the ruling have we already seen? How will it change the incoming workforce of the future? And how can employers adapt? I asked Indeed's Senior Vice President of Environmental, Social, and Governance, LaFawn Davis, to parse out exactly what the ruling changes and what it doesn't. LaFawn, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Kate. So let's start with the letter of the law. There seems to be so much confusion around it. So what does the Supreme Court's affirmative action ruling actually mean for hiring at companies? Large in part, organizations are already not allowed to use race as a factor in actual hiring decisions. At Indeed, we believe that talent is universal, but opportunity is not. And there are significant disparities that exist throughout the world of work for members of marginalized and vulnerable communities, most notably in leadership positions and higher paying sectors like technology, finance, and professional services. The primary gateway to these opportunities is typically a degree from a selective college or university, yet these same disparities are evident throughout higher education. And for more than 50 years, affirmative action has created educational opportunities for millions of people who are minorities in America. Without the opportunities created by affirmative action, there are likely to be less BIPOC or Black, Indigenous, people of color, candidates from these selective schools, not because they don't have the aptitude, but because those systemic inequities still exist, which will lead to a less diverse talent pipeline. That's really important, I think, for people to understand exactly what you just said. And let's kind of underline it again so people don't miss it, because that is a big point of confusion, right? Is that, okay, so now race can't be a factor in college admissions. It also means that it can't be a factor in hiring, but that's always been the case. That's long been the case. That's correct. So how it will impact hiring is the pipeline more so than the hiring practices. But how how does it impact some kind of common diversity-focused hiring practices that I think you know maybe our listeners have heard of, like the double Rooney rule, which is where you interview two candidates from underrepresented backgrounds. Absolutely. Well, while the SCOTUS decision does not directly impact corporate DEI programs, we've definitely seen companies changing or kind of backing down from some of their DEI commitments. And indeed, we continue to work on our own DEIB Plus initiatives to build a team that better represents the world of job seekers and employers around us. When you look at things like the Rooney Rule, the real program is not a hiring program. The Rooney Rule is about interviewing. So it's about screening people into the process that you maybe haven't historically seen and interviewing them as part of the hiring decision. But the Rooney Rule is not about who you can hire. And I think that's the key distinction there. Most people think it's about you have to hire X amount of underrepresented ethnic minorities or women, but it really is about including them into the hiring process. That's all that it is. 
Yes, exactly. I think it's about widening your applicant pool and who you interview. And that kind of what you're hinting at of like, it doesn't mean that you hire this amount of people. That's something that I think people get really stuck on with affirmative action is a quota system. And I think that's a fear, right? It's like, oh, there's this quota system where you're going to have this many people. Our companies are not doing this, right? No, absolutely not. Like anything that you want to improve, companies are setting commitments. They're setting goals to have a more diverse workforce, but there's no quota system. That actually would be illegal to say we only can have this amount of this and this amount of that. And I will not hire you because of race, but I will hire you because of race. All of those are, are illegal hiring practices. So what companies are really doing are trying to make sure that they are including historically underrepresented people within their workforce. They're trying to make sure that their workforce is more diverse. And to do that, you have to change hiring practices that systemically have excluded a lot of the workforce. So in order to do that, you have to be intentional. You have to say, what about our hiring practices are actually excluding people? What are we doing that is making it so that women are not applying? Or um, do we see that as women are applying, for instance, uh, they are falling out of the phone screen process or in resume review or when they get to the final stages? What is it about our hiring practices that is actually screening people out? And that's what companies are focused on. That's a great point that I have a feeling that people listening are like, yes, okay, sure. But how do I do that? How can you, <laughs> can you give some examples of how people can look for those flaws? Absolutely. So I think you have to look at things like bias and barriers to entry, right? So that could be because of gender bias. That could be um, because of race, disability. It could be about criminal records. There are all these things that are kind of barriers to historical barriers to employment. And what companies can do is really is really examine their processes, their practices, and their own policies and focus on things like skills-based hiring. We know that qualified job seekers, no matter what they look like or where they come from, are often overlooked because they lack, you know, things like an academic credential, like a college degree, even when they have relevant skills to offer. You know, I will often share, Kate, that I don't have a college degree. And I'm a senior vice president at a, a pretty awesome company at a very successful company. And I will often tease people like I am, I am brilliant. I am strategic. I am an empathetic and authentic leader, operationally minded. I have all of these amazing skills. Can you imagine what Indeed and any other company would miss out on if they simply look to check the box on whether or not I had a college degree? There's so many people like me, right, that have skill, but they get overlooked because of that specific checkbox. That's so true. And we, you know, we did an episode last season with our news editor, Christopher Zara, who also does not have a college degree and wrote about his experience in trying to break into the professional world without okay. a college degree. And we at Fast Company and a lot of other companies I know are making a move to remove degree requirements from job postings. I think, as you say, that really, really opens up the candidate pool. Are there other ways that employers who have traditionally recruited from particular universities or universities in general can adapt their hiring process, their, their candidate pool to not miss out on those folks. Absolutely. Kate, and that line always cracks me up. We can't, we just can't find them. We can't find people of underrepresented backgrounds. And I'm like, we're out here. Um, <laughs> so again, it's about the hiring practices. You can do things like tap into your existing DEI networks and partnerships. If you're specifically trying to make sure that, say you're focusing on AI, which everybody is right now, it's the hottest topic. Um, can you make sure that you are finding women in AI? There are networks for that. There are organizations that focus on underrepresentation within specific fields. You can also look to your employee resource groups or business resource groups to help give referrals. You can also make sure that you mentioned ERGs and business resource groups as part of your job postings. The language of ERG is mentioned in job postings on Indeed. I think it grew almost 500%, 497% from 2019 to 2023. So companies are trying to make sure that candidates know that they are focused on having a more diverse workforce. They're also trying to make sure 
that candidates know that the company is focused on having an environment and communities in which they can thrive. Yeah, I think that's very important. And I think you're, you're right that it's, it's so frustrating that it's like, oh, we're just going to, you know, recruit from these same handful of, of universities as, and then complain that the pipeline is, is broken. And it's broken. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's broken because I, what I'm doing is not working. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so it seems pretty clear. I think affirmative action ruling does not, in fact, impact hiring, I think it also is clear or should be clear that it doesn't impact DEI programs and departments at companies, although many DEI executives, especially at the major tech companies, have left in the last couple of years. Some companies are kind of using affirmative action ruling as an excuse to like roll back their DEI initiatives. Do you think that that is kind of happening more? Will it make these DEI leadership roles that were already kind of facing high levels of burnout even more difficult? You know, Kate, we often will see a rollback of DEI initiatives during times of economic uncertainty. You know, it'll be one of those things where companies that weren't necessarily really serious about change will kind of cut the quote unquote good stuff. It's kind of cyclical in that way where we see economic uncertainty and DEI programs get cut. But right now we're looking at uh, the addition of, as you mentioned, kind of this environment of companies who are it's like a political landscape. There's a lot of talk about, well, if we roll back affirmative action, everything has to roll back. What we're seeing on Indeed is that there was an increase from 2019 until now of about 23% for DEI job postings. You know, oftentimes you would see a director role or team job postings that were posted. And up until now, we have seen a decline We've seen a decline of 34.4% just between August of 2022 to August of 2023 of this year. And we're going to continue to track the data. But I think two things can be true at the same time. So there are some companies who are backing away from this work or who maybe were doing kind of performative check the box exercises in the first place. And so it's not a surprise if they roll it back. But also, This work is really hard, Kate. (laughs) This work is really, really hard work. And burnout is real. Oftentimes, companies that, you know, we're like, oh my goodness, we've never had someone focus on this before. We really want to have this be owned by someone to help drive more diverse and inclusive and equitable practices. And they will normally hire a team of one. And that team of one (laughs) does not have the power to make sense systemic, long-term change, right? They they really have to have the support needed, the budget needed, the leadership accountability needed. Otherwise, you are choosing someone typically who's already in one of the like vulnerable or marginalized communities to lead the charge to help the company change. And without the true support that that person or that team needs, they're going to burn out. Within a year, almost guaranteed they're going to burn out. And so we also see that happening within the industry. It's almost like, a, you know, another version of a glass cliff where it's like, oh, we have this problem here. You solve it. Oh, wait, you can't solve it. Guess it's unsolvable. And now you've burned out. And we, I mean, you set people up to fail in, the, in those positions. Absolutely. And I think you're right that it is the companies that would want to be rolling these back. We're kind of doing it in a performative way anyways, are like affirmative action is a, is a great excuse for, it doesn't matter that it's actually not true. We'll just like use it as an excuse to do something that we were kind of, you know, not committed to in the first place. Absolutely. <laughs> You mentioned this a little bit, but I mean, anybody listening to this will know this, that DE&I and affirmative action, the all of these kind of issues have been very politicized and have become kind of talking points in the, in the far right's air quotes, anti-woke efforts, especially in places like Florida that are trying to ban even the mention of diversity, equity, and inclusion. What can businesses and prospective employees and college students who are in these hostile environments do to counteract this kind of attack? So the first thing that companies can do specifically is stay the course. If you are really serious about changing the system from within, you have to stay the course. So like at Indeed, we're committed to help 30 million job seekers facing barriers get hired 
the things that we're talking about, the systemic inequities, the hiring process, those things are barriers to entry. And so just focusing on your own hiring practices is a great way to continue to stay the course. But as additional barriers go up, we have to work that much harder to help people find jobs. This includes job seekers with different forms of education, such as apprenticeships, on-the-job training, military training. As I mentioned, focusing on kind of skills-based hiring is the greatest way to open up your pipeline. So we've recently, we've launched um, something called Skill Connect, which is a new resume and job search experience designed exclusively for learners, gaining skills through training programs that are provided by our partners. So Skill Connect makes it easier for learners to represent the skills and training they've received on their Indeed resume instead of that college degree. And once they've completed their resume, job seekers are matched with employers who are searching for people with their specific skills and their training on Indeed. We're also doing something like um, we're launching an, an internal apprenticeship program. We're calling it an internal ship to help underrepresented genders, you know, gender fluid, non-binary women and underrepresented ethnic minorities to advance into leadership roles within the tech space. So when people go from kind of a non-technical role into a technical role, we want to help with that internally within our own company. Participants will be able to learn how to become software engineer and how to kind of move into other STEM fields. And that's just one example of how we want to support people to just kind of move around into fields that maybe they didn't have the opportunity to before or when they started their career. Skills-based hiring also includes things like individuals with criminal records. You know, as we help finding job seekers with barriers and help them find work, it's really through inclusion of things like fair chance filters on Indeed.com and other tools. So just like you're screening out people that don't have a college degree, employers are also screening out people that have criminal records. Uh, we want to make sure that we're holding ourselves accountable. Having a criminal record is the only barrier where it is legal to discriminate. It is legal to discriminate. So we became a fair chance employer and we are encouraging other companies to become a fair chance employer because it is, it is no more likely that someone with a criminal record does something wrong at work than it is for someone without a criminal record to do something wrong at work. And again, just like a college degree or someone without a college degree, someone that has a criminal record, you want to look at their skill set. Someone could you know, have the skills that you need, but you are going to screen them out because of their criminal record. They could be great with operations or logistics or strategists or any of those things. The barriers that exist in the hiring process, the best thing a company can do is look at, again, look within. What are we doing to screen people out? People without a college degree, people with the criminal record, people with a disability are often screened out. Bias exists for all sorts of people that are historically vulnerable. And so that's the best thing that a company can do is say, how can we make sure that we are screening in for the skill set that we need and make sure that we're dismantling the systemic inequities that we have within ourselves? Employers who are committed to creating an inclusive, equitable workplace and are concerned about the impacts of the SCOTUS ruling should really implement, as I've mentioned, the skills-based hiring into their recruitment strategy they also can remove college degree requirements where you mentioned that Fast Company is doing that. Indeed is absolutely doing that where it makes sense. There are absolutely some jobs that still uh, a college degree is absolutely necessary. You can become a fair chance employer and make sure that you let it be known that you are a fair chance employer. You can make sure that people with disabilities understand that you have an environment that is created for them and you want to screen them in for the skills that they have and make sure that you have accommodations. Your job postings should all say all of those things about your hiring process and the kinds of people that have historically faced barriers that you are focused on them, right? There's nothing wrong with focusing on including more people into your process. And then internally, focusing on the environment that you have. Do people feel like they belong? there, no matter where they come from? Do you have an environment of psychological safety so that people can thrive? Because the worst thing you can do is just focus on bringing people in and they come into an environment that's not really created for them and they walk out the door less than a year later. 
So I think that there's a, a spectrum of things. It's not just about the hiring. It's also about making sure that you have the type of company culture where everybody can belong. In our coverage of this topic, we spoke to Alvin Tilly, a Northwestern professor who consults on, with businesses on their DEI practices. And he had this great quote that said, you can't ban equity and inclusion. Like even if they're trying to ban diversity in some sort of way, yeah. you can't ban equity and inclusion. So how do you suggest leaders kind of double down on the E and the I of the DEI right now? Yeah, you kind of have to look at your entire employee life cycle job seekers before they actually become employees, all the way through how you are providing opportunities, how you're growing people, how people are moving around, how they're being promoted. All of those things are really important, I think, for you to examine as a company. When you're looking at attracting people, it is okay to have something Rooney Rule-like as long as you are doing it to include people into the process. We call ours the inclusive interview rule because we wanted to make sure it was understood this is not about who you hire. This is about including more people into the hiring process. You know, you wanna always hire the best. I always hear that, well, shouldn't you just focus on hiring the best? Absolutely, but if you're not seeing everyone, how are you sure you're hiring the best, right? So that's really what our inclusive interview rule is about, and it's about the interview phase only, not hiring. We focus on women, underrepresented genders, those who identify as underrepresented racial and ethnic minorities. And honestly, since its implementation in 2021, just in the US, uh, we've seen over 50% of individuals who identify as women or underrepresented ethnic minorities. We have seen over 30% of individuals who identify as underrepresented ethnic minority. And we've seen almost 20% of individuals who accepted offers that identify as both underrepresented ethnic minority and women or underrepresented genders. So we also want to look at intersectionality. No one is a binary identity, right? And I think sometimes companies get very caught up in that binary identity, but we're all intersectional. So it's really at looking at what diversity means for a workforce. So that's on the way in. We also have something called an employee lifecycle team that is part of our DEIB plus team. So that's diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging. The plus is on there. It's kind of like the LGBTQ plus community. We've got a long way to go, <laughs> right? And we, we know that it's not inclusive of all of the work that we have. So we have an employee lifecycle team that's responsible for the overall system processes and direction of and training of our ecosystem. So not just making sure that people are coming in the door, but making sure that our leaders understand how they need to be accountable for DEI, that we have managers that know how to set the tone of psychological safety on their team, that uh, people really do understand what inclusive interview rule really means. And again, it's about including and screening in but that we have all of these kind of learning opportunities and policies once someone comes in the door. And the team has designed solutions to help mitigate bias, implement process, ensure inclusive operations across Indeed. So it's almost like a, an accountability partner to make sure that we are putting our, I would say money where our mouth is, but that we're putting things into place to actually make change. And they're looking over the entire employee life cycle from someone's on their way in all the way to on their way out. That's really important. And I do like that kind of framing as an accountability partner to yourselves, or are <laughs> we doing the things that we promised we would do that we're saying that we're going to do? And, and the on the way out part is really important too, of a kind of under when people are leaving, understanding why, why people are leaving. Absolutely. Are there any court cases or legislative battles that, that are happening right now that are around hiring or DEI initiatives that you're kind of keeping an eye on that, that might be the kind of the next, the next thing coming? The one that comes to mind for me is I'm watching this space around the BC firm that focuses on Black women owned businesses and they're called uh, Fearless Fund. I think that the same, you know, organization, the same person and organization who put up affirmative action to be dismantled is also now going after other layers. It's Edward Bloom's American Alliance for Equal Rights. They are trying to block this VC firm from being able to fund Black women. And right now, um, the case is sitting in Atlanta. There was a judge that gave a, a stay on the lawsuit and was allowing the organization to continue. 
And then that got stopped recently by a higher court who is now investigating the merits of the lawsuit and whether or not it is illegal for what this uh, VC firm is doing. So it's not about school anymore, but anything that's focused on providing opportunity to those who have historically not had it. There is definitely a faction of politics that is going after those efforts. So it's starting there where there are companies who are focused on, let's make sure we're providing equity to those who haven't had it. And there are people coming after that. And so I kind of feel like companies will be next, but unless you are a government contractor or you are getting government program funding, then you're less susceptible to have to stop your programming. And so I think they're going after the layers of programs and organizations that are government attached so that they can actually sue. They can put a stop to it. There are many, I want to call nefarious people lurking in the corners right now, watching to see what actually, what lawsuits, what laws get overturned so that they can go after the next step. I actually don't have any doubt that companies will be next. Public companies first, then private companies in order to stop this ever-changing space and world where people just want it to be more equitable. The laws that we have in place around equality are so far off. Equality is like the end state. We are all equal as humans, but our societal norms dictate that we're not. And I feel like that is what the political landscape is going after now with the anti-wokeness. Anything that looks like it's providing opportunities to those who haven't had it, there's going to be an attack. And so I think companies have to like, no, we're standing strong because we're actually committed to having a more equitable workforce and an equitable society. I think that's the thing to remember, right? It's not about taking opportunities away from people. It's giving people a fair chance. It's giving people more opportunities, not taking away. And I think that tends to be that fear, right? It's like, you're taking things away from me. That's absolutely it. That's why we're watching this space. The plan is to make sure they're stopping any progress to make this a more equitable world, right? Power does not give up power willingly. Mm-hmm. So that, I mean, that's what all of this is about. All of the laws, even affirmative action, Roe versus Wade, like all of this is about power. And so we're all just like, well, okay, this was a win today. Oh, no, no, they're rolling it back. They're rolling it back. <laughs> like you said, both sides are ready. You know, nobody's being caught flat footed. And, the, you know, if you know what's coming, then you can know how to prepare. Yeah, that's the hope. How do you see diversity in hiring and equity and inclusion and belonging within companies changing or evolving in the next, we'll say, five years? I'm an optimist, Kate. Good. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I have to be. I've been doing this work for almost 20 years, you know? So if I lose hope, (laughs) I feel like it must be really bad. Again, some of this, it just feels familiar because I'm used to the up and down kind of cycle of this. I think we saw a significant difference in like 2020, 2021, where we saw a lot more activity than I think ever before. But again, there was a good portion of that that was performative. I think what we also saw, though, was job seekers, employees, even consumers of brands who were saying, what you're doing isn't good enough. Standing in solidarity with means nothing. Thoughts and prayers don't get me a paycheck. And so I think what we're seeing are, even though there's political stuff happening, and that will continue to happen, especially going into this election year, I think the people are more resilient and resigned to continue to push. So we saw people saying, your brand doesn't fit my values. I'm not shopping with you. I'm not buying from you. Or we saw people calling out companies like, why is your entire leadership team all white men, but you claim to care about diversity, right? Or when they do see that lone person, that lone, especially Black woman who's trying to drive DEI initiatives at a company, they're calling that out. They're having her back, (laughs) right? So I, although we're seeing some heaviness right now and some companies, I think, in fear, upsetting clients or consumers, depending on who they're 
consumer bases, I feel like there's still going to be a steady course toward making change. I have to believe that. Otherwise, what are we doing? Right. <laughs> so I think, I think as the, the, population continues to push, even generationally, we are seeing people who are like, I don't care what you used to put up with. Like, this isn't okay for me. And I actually don't want to discriminate. I don't believe that this is a meritocracy. I think we need to actually examine ourselves. That is what gives me hope for the future is that the people aren't having it anymore. After the affirmative action rule, we're seeing all of these other lawsuits, but then there's also all of the people that are saying, no, if you're going to discriminate more or try to put more guardrails on it, more and more people are going to speak up and say, like, the people are not having it anymore. We're going to call you out on it. Uh, LaFon, thank you so much for being here. This is a, a great conversation as always. Thank you so much for having me, Kate. It was great to talk with you again. And that's all for this episode. If you're a new listener, be sure to subscribe to The New Way We Work wherever you listen. And if you like this episode, leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. And we want to hear from you. Work is changing every day. What's the most pressing issue on your mind? Email us at podcast at fastcompany.com. The New Way We Work is produced by Joshua Christensen and Julia Shu with editing by Nicholas Torres. 